hi everyone. Welcome to the newly named Yasmin Muhammad podcast. Um, I've switched over from calling us Forgotten Feminists because I wanted to just give myself sort of a broader range so that I could invite different guests. Um, but of course, my favorites will always be Forgotten Feminists. And my guest today is Lois, who you might recognize from past Forgotten Feminists episodes. Um, she is somebody who we've heard little bits and pieces of her story, but today, finally, we get to get the whole story. Lois, it's an absolute pleasure to be hosting you today on the new Yasmin Muhammad podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. And I must say, I come all the time because I'm in total awe of the women that have been on uh, your podcast. Amazing women. So Just like you, you're an amazing me. woman. Well. So, so thank you for being here. Um, so let's start off with you telling me about, okay, Nazarene, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Nazarene. So Church you grew up Nazarene. Nazarene. Yeah the Church of Nazarene um, in Kansas City. Right, Missouri. Um, Missouri. Can you tell us a bit about who are the Nazarene? What is the, you know, what makes the church different from, you know, just the average Protestant church or the Catholics or Mormons or anybody else that we might be familiar with? What makes them special and different? <clears throat> Well, I'm, I'm going to start out by saying that uh, there are about 40,000 Protestant denominations. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they'll run into one verse in the New Testament and they can't agree on how to interpret it. And so somebody forms a new denomination. So when, when the Church of the Nazarene was formed, the... Can Methodist I just pause Church, right there? I just yeah. want to pause right there and remind you of the life of Brian. Remember that? <laughs> what, what was it again? The, the, the Judeas front or the front of Judea or something. And they were like, ah, heathens. And then they switched off yes, and made their new group. Right. That's what that kind of reminded me of what you just said there. Like they could disagree with the smallest right. thing. And then they're like, forget it. Uh -huh. you know? Oh, exactly. <laughs> that, that's, that's how it is. So the, the Methodist church was getting too worldly, meaning mm -hmm. that they were getting too sinful and too lax and not being strict enough. And uh, two or three different uh, denominations branched off. And so that was pretty much the way it was with the Church of the Nazarene. So it really has the background in the Methodist church. And there's, like I said, there's quite a few others that are very similar. But uh, so the, the basic beliefs are just the really basic Protestant, you know, Jesus died for our sins, and we can be saved and go to heaven uh, because he he died for our sins and forgives us. And uh, in, in the, uh, well, in, in many of the religions, being saved is the first step because it, it is, we are, em it's emphasized that we were born in sin because of the mm -hmm. sins of Adam and Eve. And therefore we have sinful natures. And, but it's still possible to be cleansed of that sinful nature by being sanctified. So after you've done all the prayer to get saved, then you still have this sinful nature and you have to go pray again and get sanctified. And then you're cleansed of that sinful nature. Of course, you can still backslide. You can still become a sinner again. And then you have to go through the process again. Uh, so that's it's called the Armenian type of Protestant. There's mm -hmm. Calvinists. and Because Calvinists are, quote, once in grace, always in grace. So once you've really been saved, then that's it. You're okay. in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, in the Armenian side, you can always backslide <laughs> and become a terrible person again. Anyway, so it's, it's well, as, as silly as all the rest of them. But that's, yeah. that's how I was raised. And uh, they, really, they really pounded into you that you have a sinful nature. 
Mm. And that, you know, you, you are nothing. You are nothing without God. And that uh, really screws up a lot of people's minds. Oh, yeah. And emotions. Yeah. For sure. Um, as you were talking, I was kind of just making automatic comparisons to how I grew up Muslim. And um, it's kind of the opposite in that you are taught, to, well, you were taught to kind of have this feeling that you are sinful and that you need to be constantly cleansing yourself of that sin, mm -hmm. um, constantly backsliding and having to clean yourself up again. And be, uh, with Islam, it's like the minute you just say the one phrase, the Shahada, it's like, now you're yeah. better than everybody else in the world. <laughs> and it's like this supremacist attitude of like, well, that's it now. Now I'm, I'm one of the good people and all of you are sinners. Oh, and wow. it's just, a, it, it doesn't matter what you do at that point. I mean, there's countless videos you can hear of imams talking about like, doesn't matter if you murder or rape or whatever you do, oh. you know? <laughs> yep. Then wow. as long as you're you know, a believer, as long as you're praying to Allah, as long as you're a Muslim, oh. then you're all good. So it's a, oh, it's a wow. completely different mindset. Yeah, um, yeah. It screws people up, of course, just mm -hmm. like the mindset that you were raised in screws people up, but just different flavors of screwing people up, different methods exactly. of screwing uh -huh. people up. Uh -huh. um, but tell me what it was like for you as a child, as a young woman, growing up in that church so like your day-to-day -day, was it like if you're Jehovah's Witness for example you can't celebrate certain holidays not even your own birthday um I interviewed a woman who was part of a Methodist cult before where she couldn't drink alcohol and there was all sorts of different rules like that did you have any kinds of rules that um that surrounded your church oh yes yes <laughs> In fact, it was almost like, you know, don't or can't were the words you're always hearing and saying. Um, <clears throat> right, we could not go to, to movies. We could not no. go to dance, couldn't dance. Uh, and of course, no drinking, no smoking. Um, and no playing cards because that's what they gamble with. And so they're wow. evil. And um, yeah, so it was, it's pretty much, you know, you can't do, you can't do anything. Uh, so we had our own, our church teenager, when I was a teenager group, uh, that we'd have parties all the time, but there wasn't much we could do, just play silly games. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was constant can't, don't, you know. And in fact, when I was a senior in high school, one of my best friends from, since kindergarten, was homecoming queen. And she was going to be, you know, crowned queen. And I, I wanted to go to the coronation, but it was at a dance. It was mm. at the high school in the gym. And I just, I kept asking my friend, I says, look, I'm not gonna dance. I'm just gonna stand there. I just want to see Linda coronated. You know, she's been my friend since kindergarten. And uh, <clears throat> they, they kind of said, okay, but they were very upset. I did go, I did see her crown, but I didn't, you know, do anything else, just watched and then left. Um, yeah. But my parents were rather upset even by that. <clears throat> so, wow. Yeah, we, we were isolated. Well, we were in our invisible bubbles. Yes, my God, words, girl, we really did live parallel lives in different religions. Oh, right. And uh, well, that's, you know, all of, you know, the women that have been on your show, I, I keep identifying with them. Uh, now, of course, our lives were never in danger, like, oh, like many of you have been. But all of the other things are, mm -hmm. are very All the similar. rules. All the rules, the rules sound very yes. similar. No music, no dancing, no alcohol, no, the bubble that you were talking mm -hmm. about being separated mm -hmm. from the people around you. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was a verse, uh, be ye in the world, but not of the world. Yeah. So in other words, yeah. we have to get through this world, but we're not a part of it. We don't belong here. You know, mm -hmm. we're just passing through. And so you get this sense of never belonging. Yeah. And, but with us, it was, um, no, you know, by 
seeing us being around us, you don't know that. But inside, we're feeling that we're, you know, we're not part of this. Mm. And uh, when <laughs> people like this are all around you, you just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, you know, internally, we feel isolated. Mm. Because we can't associate with our with the people we'd like to to do things with. Because I had some good friends in in public schools, but I couldn't go anywhere or do anything with them. Yeah, you could never really truly identify with each other because you were oh, no. you always knew you were an other. Yeah. Exactly. You know, they may not be aware, but you knew right. what your limitations were. Um, even down, I can't, I can't get over how similar it was, what you just described, the similarities to Islam, even down to like not being allowed to play cards. Like it doesn't feel like a big deal, but when you make all of these rules that separate you from your peers, you don't know when it's going to pop up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. Like you just described your friend's coronation. You know, you've known her since you were in kindergarten. Can you imagine if you hadn't gone? You know, oh. she would have been hurt by that. And mm-hmm. how would you to describe to her, like explain to her she, how difficult it would be for her to understand? Like, well, I'm sorry that I couldn't support you, even though I've known you my entire life. But <laughs> there is music there and I might mm-hmm. accidentally tap my toes and that would be misconstrued <laughs> as dancing. <laughs> uh-huh. you know what I mean? oh, yes. And it's like you just sound like a crazy person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you keep it to yourself well, I- and and. Well, of course, all my friends knew I couldn't go to shows with them because I'd be invited mm-hmm. and I'd say, no, I can't go. You know, I'm not allowed. And oh. uh, they thought it was a little strange, but I was lucky. They were pretty, they were pretty good about it. That's I good. didn't get, you know, teased and tormented about it. No, yeah. but I just couldn't be with them. So what is it with movies? Why, why did they have a problem with movies? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure. They were just, they're sinful. Now, most mm. movies are okay, but there's, you know, there's those few that you're going to see something terribly sinful and right. be tempted. It's the temptation. Mm. You know? mm-hmm. And so we couldn't even go to the the <laughs> Disney movies <laughs> because mm. they were in the same place as the others. And uh, it was just all evil. So we stayed away. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, that's one of the first things the Taliban did in Afghanistan, shut down the movie theaters. One of the first things the Islamic Republic of Iran did. That's one of the first things that they that they do is shut mm-hmm. down the movie theaters. Wow. Um, yeah, so, so weirdly similar. Yeah. Um, same thing with me. We weren't allowed to go to the movies either, either but we were allowed to, once it started to become a thing, um, get videos and watch them at home. Like we could go to Blockbuster, Mm -hmm. but there was something about the movie theater that it was like the sinful place. Yeah. It was dark and there was boys and girls holding hands, (laughs) you know, (laughs) we we couldn't go bowling either because that was a sinful place. Bowling alleys were sinful. So. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you do always feel isolated and did you really feel like, I mean, I, I expect that, especially when you started teaching at a Christian college that you would have felt like your entire life was in this bubble because you're oh, working absolutely. there, your yeah. friends, your family, your community, everything is like just regurgitating this oh. same cult mentality. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yes, <laughs> absolutely my life did re- revolve around the church because I, uh, when in undergraduate school, I went to a Nazarene college. And so then, you know, we hardly ever even saw anybody that wasn't the Nazarene. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> graduate school, you know, you have to go to that sinful place, but <clears throat> in your mind, you stay isolated. Mm-hmm. I, I just, for most of my life, I always had this sense of, uh, being an observer of the world, but not a participant. I don't belong here. I, you know, <clears throat> just this constant sense of not belonging. I 100% know what you mean by that. I really do. And I, and in fact, I didn't even really even notice it until mm-hmm. after I left Islam. And, and I, 
I, I say it like I say, I joined humanity. It's like all of a sudden I became mm-hmm. part of this cycle of, you know, mm-hmm. down to like the trees and the grass and the wind and the water. Like suddenly I was part of this planet, of this earth, mm-hmm. of humanity, because I didn't even realize how separate from everything I felt, not just because mm-hmm. it was very similar to you in that not only was I separated from humanity, of course, but you also feel separated from the earth. You feel separated from the planet Mm -hmm. because you're told this world means nothing. This world Mm -hmm. is meaningless. It's the next world that you need to be worried about. Yeah. Yeah, So you're not connected to anything. No, you're not. No. And yeah, I felt, I felt very disconnected and, and sort of adding to that, my, my poor dear mother, she, um, I'm sure she was clinically depressed her entire adult life. And that rubbed off on, on the rest of us. And mm-hmm. so not only did I feel like I didn't belong, I feel like I didn't have a right to belong. Like I was kind of worthless because that's how she saw herself. And that's what she communicate, communicated to her daughters was, you know, just we're really pretty worthless. And, uh, so even when I deconverted, it was quite a while before, it was a long time before I could get beyond that feeling of not belonging. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Same. So, <clears throat> and of course, so, nobody around you is aware of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's your own mm-hmm. mind prison that you have to overcome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're yeah. the only person that can break those bars. Right. Um, so you, you mentioned that your mom was that way with her daughters. Did you have any brothers? I have one brother, yeah. And, and because was there was, a difference? <clears throat> yeah. Because he was a boy, then he would, I mean, in my mother's mind, because he was a boy, he would be like his father, who was wonderful. And he was wonderful. And so she didn't communicate that to him. It was, it was her daughters that, you know, because we're girls, we'd be more like her and therefore we're worthless. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. So it wasn't necessarily a Nazarene, the church of Nazarene thing. It was a mom thing that made this separation well, between boys. No, and girls. it was, it was, but then, then I go to church and the church, I mean, they really preach, you know, that <clears throat> we are born in sin. We are sinners. We are incapable of doing anything well, doing anything right. And if we mm-hmm. ever do anything well in our lives, it's because God is working through us. It's not us. Mm-hmm. If we Mm -hmm. do something wrong, it's our fault. Mm -hmm. And so we were, so it was, it was like the combination at home. My mother would kind of indicate I was worthless and go to church and they'd say, oh, absolutely. You're worthless, you know, and uh, you know, we're not of this world. Uh, And so it just came from all directions. My goodness. So did you sense as a girl that there was, um, sort of a, a support for patriarchy or there is a sexism within your church or was that not very prominent? It was very prominent in the church. I was very lucky. My father, uh, in a sense, he saw a separation of tasks, you know, like he would not go into the kitchen. Uh, my grandmother lived with us. So she, <laughs> nobody went into the kitchen, but, um, uh, so in that way, he was, you know, I can't say patriarchal. A man of his time, I guess. Yes, yes. But he was very caring and compassionate. And um, I mean, we knew we were loved and accepted no matter what. That's what And that's all that was. And he valued education. Oh, did he value? Well, his parents made him. Uh, quit school at age 14 and go to work and help support the family. And so education was everything to him. And so I was very lucky in that way because he was thrilled when, when I was really went into state in academics. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my mother sort of indicated that I was kind of worthless as a female. No, she told me nobody ever look at me. And, uh, so I just went towards academics. 
And that's, uh, and my father was supportive and that was wonderful. I'm so glad you had that counterbalance to your mom's negativity. Um, that probably ended up saving your life. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so now you grew up in the church of Nazarene. You were going to church almost every day, whether it was youth groups or to go pray mm -hmm. or, or whatever the case may be. You end up teaching at a Christian college. Mm -hmm. um, so now you're fully immersed and isolated. And mm -hmm. tell me how you ended up meeting <laughs> and marrying an ex-con. Oh, yes. Oh, what a story. Um, our college it was Spring Arbor College. Actually, it was a free Methodist college, which is almost identical to Nazarene. So. Belief-wise, there's no difference. <clears throat> but we, uh, the college had a program in a prison that was just very close by. In fact, it was the largest walled prison in the world, I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, oh, yeah, in, in Jackson, Michigan. Uh, so it was a, a guy that got out of prison there, came to the college as a student. and. <clears throat> he said, well, I have, I've just got this fabulous friend in prison who is <laughs> extremely intelligent. And he was, he was incredibly intelligent. Um, and, and oh, actually, who is now my ex, uh, got out of Jackson prison, but then it, <laughs> he ended up in a federal prison, a uh, bank oh. robbery. You know, not too smart then, is he getting caught again? <laughs> true. And, well, there's a difference between IQ and 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 street smarts. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> and luck, but too, sometimes. Oh yeah. And so this guy, this was a student, uh, asked me if I would write to this guy because because he's so intelligent. He needs interaction with you know intelligent women and and uh, so I started writing to him. And he was in prison in Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana. And Wait, uh, now we're, so when you were writing to him, was it with the intent to make him Christian and turn him like oh, from yes. a bad oh. bank robber into a good believer? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, so after I was writing to him for a while, then I started going to visit him in prison. And that was a fascinating experience. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and it, he had taken some courses through the college when he had been in Jackson prison. And he was, I mean, IQ wise, he was incredibly intelligent and he could write, oh, I mean, his writing was amazing. And I mean, he could make you feel the stories he, he was writing. And so he eventually got out of prison. So he came to attend school there at Spring Arbor College. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's when we got married. Because, <clears throat> like I was saying, I, I had always felt so worthless. But, well, I need to back up here a little bit. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the other things that is drilled into you when you're growing up in the Church of the Nazarene is this, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And so that had always been a huge thing with me. I've got to find God's plan for my life. You know, mm -hmm. he has his plan and I've got to find it. I've got to live it. And uh, I mean, that was, that was a huge pressure. So when I met oh, Dave, my ex, uh, it was like, oh, this is God's plan. God wants me to salvage this poor lost soul. He's got all this potential. He's brilliant. Uh, he's got this potential and, and I'm supposed to salvage him. And so, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but I genuinely believe that it was God's will, you know, that I marry him and, and can get him converted and live happily ever after. Well, <clears throat> uh, sociopaths don't change. Mm. You can't, they can't even be treated by psychologists but I'd never heard the word sociopath before. And of course, and he was an alcoholic, but of course that didn't show when he was in prison. 
because mm -hmm. you can't get your hands on it. And so that was quite an eye opener that uh, to find out that I was married to a sociopathic alcoholic. <laughs> mm, quite a shock yeah. from the father yeah. that you yeah. grew up with. So oh, you... yeah, as as opposite as you can get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was quite the learning experience. So did he what... embrace the church before you guys got married? He pretended to. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> You know, and we'd talk and he'd make promises, but of course promises mean nothing to a, to a sociopath, but I didn't understand that at the time. Uh, and I just, you know, I just still kept praying. And, you know, we were taught growing up, if you, if you love somebody deeply and pray for them, then they'll become a Christian. Of course they will, mm. you know? And uh, so you I probably felt it. responsible. You, you probably felt oh, like, yeah. oh, I'm not praying hard enough or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> but eventually, <laughs> he had a daughter from a previous marriage, but he had never known her because he'd always been in prison. <laughs> mm. And the, the, when he was out of prison, they wouldn't let him near her. And uh, her mother was inadequate. I don't know what her problem was, but she couldn't handle having a child. Well, it was when her mother passed away. She couldn't, she couldn't cope with a husband in prison and a baby. And so mm -hmm. she boarded her child, my ex's child, uh, with a woman that had a, usually day school, but Laura stayed there all the time. So then the elderly woman who was taking care of her passed away and her daughter tried to take care of her, but Laura ran away at 15. And mm -hmm. so she became a ward of the court. And they placed her in a home <clears throat> that had a 15 year old boy in it. And of course, yeah, two plus two. <clears throat> so uh, at 15, she was pregnant. And by this time, you know, uh, we were married. Then, so she, we, and again, he had never known her. He'd seen her twice in his life, but you know, she wanted to keep the baby, but in order to keep it, she had to live with guardians. So she moved in with us. We're all told strangers. And <laughs> as you can imagine, the tension got worse and worse. And she was, I loved her. She was, she was adorable. <clears throat> she was a lot like her father in personality, but uh, she was still, she was a good kid. But the, the things just blew up. I mean, that's a lot of really, stress, a yeah. lot of pressure. <clears throat> and so I told everybody, I said, okay, we're going, we're going to counseling, all of us together. And so I took everybody to counseling. Fortunately, the therapist was smart enough that he put us all in different groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, so actually, so I got some group therapy, which was great. I began to understand a lot of things. And that's when I well, the therapist was honest. He told me, he said, he, he's a sociopath. Oh, great. And some other friends in psychology told me that sociopaths can't be treated. Mm -hmm. And that's when things began to fall apart. Was I realized that, you know, if a sociopath can't be treated, this can't be God's will. Mm -hmm. Because if they can't change, then, you know, everything that I had believed was my responsibility was just not a, not an option, not possible. Mm -hmm. And that's when my, my beliefs began to break down because it couldn't be God's will. And as I became honest with myself, everything I believed started coming apart. Mm -hmm. And any doubt that I had had all my life was, yeah, I was right. I should have doubted. I should, you know. And, and so that was when I just finally realized there is no God. Mm -hmm. And everything I've been living has been false. And uh, <laughs> of course, there I was married to a sociopath and teaching yeah. at a Christian college. And yeah. internally, I'm an atheist. Wow. So that was uh, rather interesting. Yeah. I mean, it would be rather, it would be interesting and devastating, really, because you'd probably be 
filled with, well, first of all, a sense of anger that you spent so much of your life wasted on a figment of someone's imagination um, and all the wasted years and all the wasted energy you put into trying to pray for this guy and fix this guy and knowing, realizing now that that was completely futile. Mm -hmm. But you'd also be filled with a, there'd just be like a void there. Like if I am not Lois from the church of Nazarene, then who am I? Because Mm -hmm. that entire, that was your whole identity, you know, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's like, you have to rebuild yourself at that point, brick by brick. And you can't, Mm -hmm. how do you rebuild yourself when you're still in the marriage and you're still at the college like you know what I mean all of these physical oh, yeah, yeah yeah so tell us about how did at you that, do that at that point at that point all I could think about or all I was able I mean I knew that before I could accomplish anything else I had to get out of the marriage and away from the college um I loved teaching I adored teaching and uh, and that had also become part of my identity being a good teacher <clears throat> and but but that's all I had to concentrate on and the college I didn't breathe a word to a soul about how I felt how I, what I believed because I would have been fired mm-hmm. and uh, so until I could get out of the marriage and get away from the college <laughs> I had to basically live a lie yeah double I had life. To, yeah. So no one there, I mean, there were rumors going around, of course, but um, <clears throat> I never told anyone that I had stopped believing because I just, I didn't dare. I had to support yeah. myself. Yeah. And so it was just uh, <clears throat> get out of the marriage. So, and that was, go ahead. Oh, I just have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you, when you, you didn't want to tell anybody because you didn't want to lose your job. Of course, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it came out, how did your family and your friends, you know, how did everybody around you react to that? Or did you never bother telling them? Did you just I didn't tell them? Yeah. I just, part of me, I was thinking, I knew how deeply hurt everyone would be because when someone, you know, backslides, you're just devastated. Mm-hmm. And I and I had some good friends uh, among the professors at the college, and I just knew how deeply hurt everyone would be, and of course, especially my father. That was the worst thing in the world I could do was to hurt him. And I look back now and I regret it, but at the time, I I thought I I'll, I'll just sort of sneak away. So I got a postdoctoral fellowship. And that's temporary, and everybody knows it's temporary. So I just told everybody, I'm I'm going to Calgary, Alberta, to do a postdoctoral fellowship, mm-hmm. and just kind of snuck away. And just but never of course went I back. Had to get the, the, the the divorce first, and then yeah. Mm. In fact, I got a phone call once asking me to come back. We haven't replaced you. We need you, and I just said, well, sorry. <laughs> I replaced you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And and now I look back and I, I, I wish I had been more open, but at the time I just, I I was dealing with so much. I just couldn't. Yeah. I knew what the survival. Yeah. 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 I totally get that. So because just like you, I also had those two layers getting away from him first yeah. And then getting away from the greater community around me, my family. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So because he is a sociopath, I can imagine he probably was very angry at you deciding that you didn't want to be married to him anymore because sociopath, like he would probably view you as his possession and oh, he yeah. makes the he gets to decide when he doesn't want to be with you anymore, but you don't get to make that decision. You can't discard him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I was his source of, of income. income and survival. Oh, wow. Uh, because I was the breadwinner. Right. And he, you know, he did go to school and he finished. He actually ended up getting a master's degree. 
Um, but uh, I was his bread and butter. And, you know, the, the last few years, I just felt like, you know, I'm <clears throat> a meal, meal ticket and slave labor. Oh. Uh, that's what I, what I felt like. Um, so, no, I, I was, I was really, I was scared because he mm -hmm. was dangerous. And I remember talking to a friend, I'll never forget. <clears throat> I said, you know, when I was going to get the divorce and I said, well, I've got to tell him to his face. And he says, don't you dare. That was a good friend. And I, he, he gave me permission mm -hmm. to tell him from a distance. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I was able to do that because it, I would have been afraid. I would have been really <laughs> in danger if I had told him to his face that I had filed for divorce. But yeah. uh, he was far enough away when I told him. And by the time he got back, he was, who have you been talking to? You know, like I wasn't able to make a decision like that myself. Surely someone yeah. else must have convinced mm -hmm. me. You know? <clears throat> uh, but he was pretty docile after that. When it, when it was done, you know, what can he do? Uh, <clears throat> And so, you know, I was lucky the divorce went through really quick and easy. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I was really, it, it was hard getting to that point because I, I didn't know what he would do as far as, well, he had gotten me in debt already. Mm. And uh, I, I had no idea what he would do with it. I might be so deep in debt, I'd never get out. Uh, <clears throat> but I was in debt, but not, nothing I couldn't handle. Mm -hmm. And so, so I got away from, uh, ended the marriage and then it was, okay, now, how am I going to support myself? And that's mm -hmm. when I started thinking, applying for postdocs and things like that. So eventually mm -hmm. I got one at University of Calgary and a oh, whole new life. Thank goodness. Yeah. So you, you left everything behind and you came to Calgary almost a new woman because you could just be yeah. your authentic self you could be new Lois nobody knew you nobody mm -hmm. had any preconceived ideas yeah. of, like nobody had any expectations for how you're supposed to act or not supposed to act so you did truly get to rebuild yourself oh you yeah. know for, not even scratch, rebuild basically. but yeah. build yourself yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Uh -huh. from scratch exactly. yeah yeah uh-huh yeah it was it was interesting i mean being in a, a new place and well a different country but same language which was helpful um <clears throat> and you know i didn't know a soul and it was it was just fascinating i i wanted to who's going to who who are my friends are these people going to be my friends you know you, you just you just yeah. meet somebody and then are these going to be my friends <laughs> Uh, so it took a while, but every, you know, Canada is so nice and <laughs> everybody's yeah. nice. And, yeah. and, uh, but yeah, it, it, um, you know, it, it took a while. I had a lot of things to sort out in my head. Mm -hmm. No kidding. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, you know, it, it took a while and a few, uh, you know, false starts, but, uh, I got there. I got there. Yeah. It's crazy because uh, it's similar to you in that I was also going through that huge life change of like, I also moved somewhere new to completely rebuild myself. I was mm -hmm. also teaching at a college <laughs> and it's like you, you are starting from scratch, but you also are teaching full time. <laughs> in a new college uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean so it's like you don't you're, exactly you're constantly yeah. so when you say you had a lot to contend with um I mean I had student loans too so I had similar debts oh, you know what I mean like there's uh, just so many stresses yeah. all at the same time mm -hmm. at that point in my life I developed this twitch in my in my left eye that just didn't go away <laughs> for like six months <laughs> Because oh, I just, no. there was so much stress, like everything was happening all at the same time. Um, of course, mm -hmm. I had a little daughter too, so. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, you, I love the sentence that you say when you say, I, when I lost my faith, I found myself. Yes. Which I think so beautifully encapsulates everything that you, that you said here. 
Um, and like I was saying to you earlier, I, I love that you found yourself in Canada. Like I love that Canadians mm -hmm. could be that for you, that our right. country could yes. be that for you, could be the safe place to land and the place where you could flourish um, as your authentic self, because really that's what it comes mm -hmm. down to. You never got to be authentically Lois because ever since you were born, you were being told what to think, what to wear, what to say, how mm -hmm. to act, you know, mm -hmm. and so you never really got to even know who you were exactly until yeah. you you had to peel away all of these layers of expectations and demands and the guilt that you were feeling because you're you know especially your dad and how much you were going to upset him and yada 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 all that stuff so there's so much emotional baggage mm -hmm. that needs to be oh, yeah. dealt with before you can even start to you Absolutely. know, you, you don't even know who you are. Yeah. You, yeah. you know what you were told you were, but, but you're not. Yeah. And, and it takes, it takes some time and I'm sure, <laughs> which I'm sure, you know, yeah. as well or better than anyone that uh, figuring yeah. out who you are, yeah. being comfortable in your own skin is just amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I basically fashioned myself. <laughs> I created myself by uh -huh. thinking, who do I want my daughter to look up to? Oh, what yes. kind of a mom do I want her to have? Do you know what I mean? And then I was like, mm -hmm. that's who I will be. I will be that person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that kind of gave me a guiding light in a way to figure out like because it's just like you, you know, you don't, you have nothing. Like I've given away this. I don't want anything to do with what I have been up until this point. Um, so now you're just like in an ocean. I remember describing it to a friend of mine. And I said, like, I feel like I'm in this vast, vast ocean. And I can see nothing. And I have nothing to cling on to. And I just, I just don't know, like I have nothing to start with even. Um, and I'm like crying and I'm telling her how I feel. And then she said to me, but isn't that exciting? And <laughs> in that moment, it didn't feel exciting <laughs> right. at all. I was like, are you even sure. listening to that? <laughs> but <laughs> When you take a step back and think about it, it's like, yeah, it was exciting. It was good. It was, it was an exciting opportunity to be able to choose who I wanted to be and to become that person. Um, because we don't, we're not all given that opportunity, you know? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and it's a big deal <clears throat> to do that normally, but mm -hmm. because I had severed ties with everybody that you know, was not going to accept me for who I was just like you. It was like mm -hmm. a fresh start. So nobody around me yeah, had totally. any expectations. Mm -hmm. And so right. I could be and do whatever I chose. If I acted like mm -hmm. a confident feminist college <laughs> instructor, nobody yes. would know. Exactly. Uh, feminist. Weren't you the one mm -hmm. covered in niqab a minute ago? Like nobody knew that. Right. <laughs> so Right. Exactly. Yeah, it was, it was my, uh -huh. yeah, so I could just be whoever I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Did you go through a period where you were kind of faking it till you make it? Oh, absolutely. It's like, you, you just, well, I, one of, one of the big things was the fact that I was, I was doing a postdoc, so I was doing research in a lab, I wasn't teaching. And oh. teaching had been the only thing that I had ever felt like I was good at in my entire life. Yeah, it's a completely and different I lost skill set. Identity. Mm. I lost my identity as a, as a teacher. In addition to oh, gosh, which I think that was even harder than losing my identity as a Christian because I wanted to lose that one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I lost my identity as a teacher, and and I had yeah. to figure out. Well, a friend of mine who was in med school gave me this article for medical residents because they get in that, you know, I'm a doctor and that's who I am. And 
nothing else. And I read it and it helped so much. And the idea was your identity should be who you are, not what you are. Yeah. And uh, that that was a real big help in starting to, uh, you know, not think of myself as a teacher or a Nazarene or an American or I am me. Mm. I'm yes. Yeah. yeah. And oh, wow. What a. That's a big one, too. What a light. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I resigned from a tenure teaching position and you know what it's like, like tenure is like, yeah. that's it. Oh, you're done. Everything. Like yeah. at my party, they were like, you're not leaving here unless it's in a pie box. Ha ha ha. You know, yeah. like that was oh, it. Right. You're done for life. <laughs> this is it. Um, and so when I resigned from that position, which I wanted to do, I went through what you just described there, like, oh my gosh, I've worked my whole life thinking this is who I was. Yeah, yeah. To reach this pinnacle and to now walk away from it was like, it was an identity crisis for sure. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it was, I didn't want to. I mean, I still teach just at a different university and like, things are not the same. Um, but walking away from what you thought you were, mm -hmm. what is, you know, unfortunately, both of us had to do that twice, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but yeah, you're right. It makes a big difference when you feel forced into it versus choosing to do it because you didn't want it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, tell me about the impact Ayan has had on your life. Cause you and I oh. both share a mentor. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, after a number of years of just rebuilding my life, uh, I had, I just, I had escaped from anything religious. And so I ignored it for a long time, but then I, I things began to slow down and I started reading and I read Infidel, and it blew me away. And I thought, this woman, look what she is doing. I mean, her life is in danger. She has bodyguards 24-7, but she starts a foundation. She speaks. She writes. And what she's doing for people. And I thought, I have been through this journey out of religion, and I know what it's like to deconvert. I know what you go through. I should be out there supporting other people that are doing that. And, and it was that book that, that sort of gave me a new focus and goal. And so that's when I just started looking around. I hadn't paid any attention to, you know, atheist societies or anything like that. And finally, I said, okay, I've got to find, you know, something, a group somewhere that I can get involved in. And I started uh, <laughs> searching the, the web and I found atheist groups all over the place. And I found a lot of them, of course, in the US. And then, and then I found a CFI, Center for Inquiry Group in Calgary. Wow, it's right here. And they were having meetings and it, through, through Meetup. You know, and so, of course, Okay, I, I have a, a wonderful partner, John. And I said to him, oh, this looks great. And he says, well, go. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just went to one of the, well, skeptics in the pub, that people, and took off from there. And, and now that group, we've gone through a couple of iterations, and now we're the Rocky Mountain Atheists. And I mean, now my life revolves around that. And I do have a, a support group that I, I facilitate, a peer support group. We call it Life Without Religion. And I, I was amazed at the number of people that do need, mm -hmm. I mean, that are, under, that are going through the same journey and they need support. They need to know that they're not alone. And it's just in the process of, of forming and working with this group, I have met personally five ex-pastors mm -hmm. who deconverted and are atheists. 
and the number of people that go through divorces because they leave religion. Mm -hmm. It's not a choice. You can't choose to not believe or to believe. If you find out you can't believe, then you can't believe, you know? And uh, so uh, I'm just, you know, now my life is revolving around this group and I'm heavily involved in not just the peer support group, but a lot of other activities just to give a place for people to fall when they leave their religion. Yeah. Because you, you know, you just, you lose everything. You lose your community, mm -hmm. sometimes your family, you lose everything. And, and it's like, you know, where do I turn? And so we our our goal in, in the Rocky Mountain Atheist is to just provide a welcoming place to land for people that have no community. And community is so important. Yeah. And it's just it's incredibly gratifying. Yeah. And quite frankly, I have Ian to thank for all that. I've never met her. She has no idea that I exist, but she changed my life anyway. And uh next time you see her tell her that this total stranger said thank you <laughs> <laughs> i i will absolutely um what you described there is exactly what i do with with my charity free hearts free minds um but we focus on people who are leaving islam and mm -hmm. it's exactly as you described you lose your family you lose your friends in many cases you lose your partner sometimes you lose your own children mm -hmm. and people are absolutely devastated and isolated you and i had to go through this in the days before social media before we could connect with each other via zoom um yeah. so we know how treacherous that is and to be honest we both know how lucky we are to still be alive mm -hmm. you know yes, it's yes. It, it there are such dark times during that journey um that a lot of people don't mm -hmm. make it to the other side yeah That's and right. So it, it makes the work that we do with, the, you know, the way you put it, just giving people a soft place to land. You just, just to be in a space where you can communicate with others who will listen to you without yes. judging you. Yes, absolutely. That alone is huge mm -hmm. for somebody who has been told their whole life that if they even think these thoughts, let alone say mm -hmm. these words, that they are a sinner and they're going to burn in hell for eternity, mm -hmm. to just be able to be in a space. I mean, I, we've had so many clients who are from the LGBT community as well. Mm -hmm. And so they also have that extra layer of self-hate and you know, so many people tell us, like, there was this man from Saudi Arabia that was saying, I am a gay man, but I've never been with a man. You know, mm -hmm. he knows who he is, but he can never right. be who he <clears throat> is right. because of yeah. the country that he's living in. And because of the fact that in order to hide who he was, he had to mm -hmm. get married and have children and, yeah. you know. Yeah play the part. So just like you and I, we had to live a double life, but thank goodness it was mm -hmm. temporary. Yes. Just yes. till we got to safety and then we could be ourselves. But when you're living in a Muslim majority country, especially yeah. one of the 15 that will execute you for your beliefs, mm -hmm. there's that double life. There's no reprieve. You know, how do you get out of that? especially if you're married and you have children and you don't want to lose your family. Yes. And so you have to constantly be like that point that you were in right before you left for Calgary, where you're just like swallowing who you are mm -hmm. and showing the world one Lois, while you know, on the inside, you're a completely other Lois. So in our group and individual sessions, people can be their true selves. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which is the greatest <clears throat> gift, you know, and then they build a community from the people that they meet where they, there are other people in the world that know them and love them and appreciate them. 
and honor them for who they are. And so then they learn to love themselves for who they are yes. too, yeah. you know, and it, and it can only mm-hmm. go up from there. You know, it's, it's a, right. it, like you mm-hmm. said, it's incredibly rewarding. It's incredibly uplifting. It's one person at a time, but I know I'm doing good in this world. I can, mm-hmm. I can see it. I am mm-hmm. talking to the people. I am meeting the people. They're contacting me, giving me updates on what they're doing and how they're doing. And so it feels like I am contributing to humanity versus being stuck in this space of just Mm -hmm. constantly feeling the sadness and the anger, you know, so do something constructive with that. So it was yet another parallel between you and I, Lois. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to open it up to the whole group here and see if we've got some people that want to share their thoughts with uh, with you, some questions or some comments. Oh, I can see that uh, Ira is here with us today. Did I pronounce that properly? That's good. <laughs> okay, That's great. Good. great to see you. Good to see and you. And Aaliyah. And uh, Aaliyah was one of our, uh, she was actually the first person to um, inspire me to start these conversations. Um, and so it's, it's great Amazing. to see you both. Aaliyah, yeah. you are fantastic. I just, you blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any questions from anyone in the group here? Somebody Hmm. named iPhone is saying, uh, oh, my God, love you, Lois. Yes, indeed. Same here. I on meeting her. I cried when I saw especially the 24 hour security that made me so mad. Yeah, she's Hmm. on the Al Qaeda hit list. So, yeah, she needs that 24 hour security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Sahara who said that, but it looks like. um, Hi, guys. Hi, yes. Hi, yes. Oh, I always I can. (laughs) I can talk. Um, my eyes actually is bothering. Me. One of my eyes is like red, and uh, so I'm not gonna open the camera. But I would love to say, Lois, congratulations! I am so glad you you are here, sharing your story with us, and um, thank you. And you know, um, a lot of things you explain or shared, uh, it is so relatable. The a- isolation, especially, you know, from. Mm-hmm. Um, just being in this bubble, you know, this uh, circle, the group thinking is very relatable. Mm-hmm. So thank you for sharing. And I'm so happy oh. you finally said, no, I'm going to say this no to it and, you know, accomplish your freedom and found who you are. And that is thank a beautiful, a beautiful thing. So nobody can take it from you. Um, yeah, and I also so want to say something about Ayan because Ayan is, is you read the infidels and I also read the infidels, uh, the infidel book. And I read Drew and still I was in Islam, you know, I was still following and I do say mm-hmm. blindly and, and that's honestly, that's true. I was mm-hmm. blind. I was sure. just blindly following and believe in Islam. I didn't know anything about Islam. I was just told to believe this religion. I was illiterate uh, from, you know, when I was, you know, when I was uh, the beginning, when I was following. But then later on, when I became illiterate, you know, came to the United States, mm-hmm. I read and, you know, I just find out, you know, this this religion is just it's not true. And mm-hmm. this Allah is just very cru- crucial. I mean, he's very mean and tells me to hate others mm-hmm. and especially the infidels and all all that, you know. But when I read yet. Yeah, Ayan's Yasmin book too, but Ayan Hersey's book, so much related to me. Like I was just kind of like, oh my gosh, there's somebody like me. Because when I was growing up back home, I felt I was the only person thinking, why, why do I have to wear the hijab? Why do I have to undergo FGM? Why is this religion telling me to do this and this and this? But reading Ayan's book was like, oh, my gosh, I'm not alone. There's somebody else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and then finally, when I met, you know, that was just like a dream come true. And, and I remember I cried. She was holding my hand. She's the sweetest human being oh, that you can really. She's so sweet, kind. 
you know, kind human being. And she was holding my hand. I even remember, I can't even believe this happened, you know, this moment. And she told me, um, she told me to be careful because I told the incident when I was told I can be killed for just mm -hmm. having a conversation regarding about, um, I think it was about religion and it was about uh, FGM. And then Ayan Hirsi Ali name came up. And then this lady, she was a Somali woman, said that she, Ayan Hirsi need to be killed. And if I see her, I will kill her, she said. And this person mm -hmm. lives in the United States. And I said, why would you want to kill somebody? And this time I was still wearing the hijab. I was still blindly following, but questioning Islam, you know, having question, mm -hmm. reading and looking what was going on. And then she said, well, do you know I can kill you too if you leave Islam Ooh. right in front of me? Yeah, just Ooh. saying that. Why would you want to kill somebody? You live in America. You can practice your religion. Um, you know, Ayan has a right to be the person she is. But then she told me she can kill me. And that was the moment I woke up. I said, this is, this is effed up. I'm sorry, my language. This is shit. And she said, Allah, Allah allows me. She said, the Quran says, those who create corruption, people like Ayan need to die and you could also be killed if you leave Islam and remove your hijab. It was oh. devastating. That day I cried, I came home. Oh. I'm just like somebody I know, how can she do this? So I looked it up, you know what she told me, she said the Quran says so, you could be killed, it's true. Mm -hmm. so, so I told Ayan the incident and she was holding my hand and telling me just, Sahara, you need to be careful. Yes, I, I totally hear you. These things exist. And I was just crying, like, you know, seeing it. I mean, I'm glad she has the security, but how sweet and the change she's mm. making within this community and the things she's talking about, because most people are scared to talk about it. How could, how could you have so much hate and you want to kill this woman? You haven't even, they haven't, these people haven't even read her story. They can't mm -hmm. even walk the shadow, you know, behind the, the step, her steps. Like they don't know anything about her. But as you know, mm -hmm. Islam, anybody who speaks about Islam negative way, these people are just so angry and even told me they can kill me. And mm -hmm. so when you mentioned about Ayan, I was just like, oh my gosh, all emotion came <laughs> up and <laughs> I love her dearly. And I'm so glad I get to meet her. And I'm so glad oh. you read her book. And then... Mm -hmm. I read her book again after meeting her and I was just like sobbing, crying, literally, yes. literally. I mean, before I was too in the beginning, but when I read, I wasn't still, I was learning English. I wasn't very influenced English. So I read again mm -hmm. and I just understood everything. And I was in that book and it's so relatable. I feel like my story and I think so many of us mm -hmm. can relate it to her story, mm -hmm. but I'm glad mm -hmm. uh, you read her book and Lois, I'm so proud of you. And I'm just oh, so glad people are just freeing themselves and just being you who you are. So thank you for sharing and thank you for letting me rant and say no, no to Momo and F at all and, and love you ladies. <laughs> love you all. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. And I loved your, your session. It was, oh, I was amazed and in awe of you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lois. And this, you know, start starting from scratch, that is so true. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to start from scratch and look where you're at, you know. you Yes, what happened to us is awful, but you can't also feel sorry for yourself and live this victimhood mentality. You right. have to right. pick up yourself and work and, and just like, you know, do the best you can. And yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, related to the starting from scratch you know I came from mm -hmm. zero and I am where I'm at because you can't feel so I mean yeah you might feel sorry for yourself it stinks it's you know sucks but sure you gotta you gotta take some responsibility and say okay you don't like me the people who don't like you just work hard show them that you are capable and you will succeed mm -hmm. I believe that so I'm mm -hmm. proud of you and thank you for sharing your story oh, thank you so much thank you Hmm. Yura, did you want to say something to Lois? Oh, well, I want to thank you for being here and for making it. Uh, <laughs> I was not a member of a Christian cult or an Islamic cult, and I was not a member of the Jewish cult, although I thought my parents were both members 
of the opposite Jewish cult. My mother's family is Orthodox Jewish. That's a cult that sets itself apart from society. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father's family is ideologically correct, left-wing, largely communist Jewish. Uh, and that's the other that's Jewish another cult. That's the other oh, Jewish yeah. cult in America. Oh. It is not just a Jewish cult, but it's particularly a Jewish cult in America. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they were the two, and I decided for neither one, uh, which I'm glad for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I discovered that cults are more widespread. I joined the atheist cult. I discovered that it tended to be snobbish, contemptuous, to respond to disagreements by saying those are just the stupid people. Uh, and it was the same group think and the same lack of actual thinking uh, in many cases. Uh, and... I discovered I had been brought up to be a part of the mainstream cult. And it's very strange to have an idea of a mainstream cult. But it was one that several of you have discovered. It's the mainstream progressive cult, which says that we're all for minorities, da, 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 but only if they toe the leftist line. That's right. Uh, and serve a leftist interest and are pretty hostile to our society. And I have reasons to want changes in our society, but I've discovered that our society has done more for the groups that need change and help than any of the other societies around. And so mm -hmm. viewing it as our society that is the enemy is a weird cult-like atmosphere yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in my areas which need their liberations. Uh, oh. And there's the internal repression. And then they, they taught me a word in this cult. They taught me the word phrase, lateral enforcement. Lateral enforcement is when you enforce on others the norms mm -hmm. yeah. that you expect to be out there in the mainstream community. And so to avoid the accusation on yourself and on the group, you enforce it on everyone else in the group. And I discovered, oh, this is what our cult is doing. In the name of liberating ourselves, we enforce all these progressive dogmas on ourselves and hatred of our society in order the better to enforce it than on society itself. And we absolutely gratuitously make enemies of society for no reason. Society is mostly our friend. It's weird, it's strange, but it's deeply ingra ingrained and it helps hold the cult together. Uh, and then I discovered that the word cult comes from culture. And every culture is a cult, uh, or culture actually comes from cult. Culture comes from cult. Every religion is a cult. Some of them are just more mainstream than others. Some of them are mo more malicious than others. Some of them are more intense and extreme than others. Uh, and you've been a member of an extreme cult. Uh, the Lubavitch Orthodox Jews among my family are an extreme form of the Orthodox cult. Uh, but then there are others who are not extreme. And there's also a difference of generations. The older generation, my grandparents, they were Orthodox just by assumption. You know, that's what Jews are. Uh, the younger generation, my generation, it's a form of rebellion against the world for them and separating themselves mm -hmm. off. So there's, there's a substantial difference there in mentality. It's more cult-like for the younger generations. They become Lubavitch, uh, leave their own Orthodox community to be a part of this crazy sect, uh, which is a big sect, and quite important, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, uh, mm -hmm. cults are everywhere. Uh, we're all brought up in a cult-like atmosphere. We all need some psychotherapy to get out of it, uh, to, fix up, to fix the things that are screwed up when we were little. But some are members of a much more intense, closed-off one than others. Mm -hmm. And the very terrible thing is that the mainstream one can be a cult also. Uh, well, it, it's, we're human is the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the good thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been reading a lot in uh, evolutionary psychology, yeah. and uh, discovered that we all have Stone Age brains, and we're expecting too much of these brains that are virtually identical to the Stone Age people. It's been it hasn't been that long. Yeah. 
kids. I mean, since we left the, the savannas of Africa, our brains haven't changed. It hasn't been long enough. Yeah. And, and so I try to uh, give people a little uh, room to, to be human yeah. and to realize that uh, we're, we're demanding that these Stone Age brains be rational. <laughs> and they're not always, <laughs> in fact, rarely, uh, but we do our best. We do our best. Well, you've done very we try well. to. Thank you. You've done Thank marvelously. You. Yasmin has done marvelously. Yes. Very impressive. And boy, have you been through terrors. Well, I've been through <laughs> my terrors, but they compare nothing to some of the terrors that you've been through. So I am in deep admiration of you and your struggles. By the way, I have my own cult. You see here probably a couple of my <laughs> cat trinkets. Uh -huh. So the cat is my cult <laughs> object. I pledge It's a beautiful to cult. Yes, yeah. I pledge allegiance yes. to the cat. Uh, yes, they're wonderful. They're wonderful. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Um, to continue what you were saying there, Lois, so you were saying that that allows you to sort of give other people sort of the, to understand them more, to say we only have, yeah. we're still yeah. dealing with our brains that haven't quite evolved mm -hmm. to where we our world is. Yes. But that also is true for us too. I think that we need to to not forgive ourselves, but to understand ourselves and to be kind yeah. to ourselves too, because mm -hmm. we do a lot of beating ourselves up. Yes. Um, uh -huh. and, and it's important to remember at the end of the day, we are tribal animals, like we are oh, social yeah. animals. Yeah. We are group, you know, that's that's what we are, mm -hmm. you know, we're part, we mm -hmm. want to be part exactly. of a pack mm -hmm. and we're very emotional and mm -hmm. that is going to override yeah. not only what's rational, but sometimes what's even best for us because mm -hmm. we right. want the love of the people around us. Mm -hmm. And so we're willing to diminish ourselves in order to get that love. And we do all sorts mm -hmm. of irrational things all the time oh, that absolutely yeah that we have to forgive ourselves for and understand ourselves and and be kind to ourselves and it doesn't always have to make sense like sometimes you can just right. yeah this feels right and trust yourself mm -hmm. that you know what's best for you there's not some omnipotent being right. that wrote down in a book what's best for you it's here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to learn to listen to your body and listen to your gut and listen to yourself was just such a huge mm -hmm. thing for me because, yeah, you know, I, similar to you, I was raised that there is like objective, you know, mm -hmm. truth, objective morality, objective right and wrong. And that was, is written by, uh -huh. you know, some guy in a book 1400 years ago. Yeah. And so I, as a lowly human, I don't get to subjectively <laughs> choose that raping little girls is wrong. How could I, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, exactly. that's subjective. Yeah. That's how they describe it. Like you don't get to make that decision. And so it was really, it's really huge for us now to be able to, to listen to ourselves and trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Ira, mm -hmm. when you were talking, you were making me wonder if you had a similar experience to Lois in that when she was describing deconversion and rebuilding and all of that, I know that your cult was a more of a secular cult that you had to separate yourself from, but I assume that there was probably some of that as well. Yeah. Uh, psychoanalytically, it's mental blocks and vicious circles that you have to fight your way out of and get past. Uh, mm -hmm. reinforced by a huge amount of social reinforcement, uh, demands mm -hmm. for conformity, calling everyone else mm -hmm. idiots. The fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, so the fool who has said mm -hmm. in his heart that he's not a progressive, uh, they're all idiots. Uh, it's, yeah, I had to get out of that. And it's very hard because a huge part of my identity was built on mm -hmm. this feeling of group superiority. Well, there, I would do a Venn diagram, you know, a circle here and an overlapping one here. There were the intelligent people and the intelligent people. 
as kids in school, we're all trying to be the intelligent people, or at least that's one of the goals we're striving toward. But there were two versions of it. One was you did well in the schoolwork, you were intelligent, you did, you know, there was some socially negotiated objective criterion. But then there was another social criterion. You say what the smart kids say politically, socially, ideologically, on every issue under the sun from the war in Vietnam to this, to that, the other, this was a long time back. Uh, and it occurred to me, these weren't the same groups. I was a member of both of them. And I was very lucky that I scored well on the objective academic criteria. I could give up the second one and start thinking for myself on social and political matters. But it was still hard because mm -hmm. that was the day in, day out praise as an intelligent person came from that group. And then yeah. and you got scored on your exams. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was secure in my status as an intelligent person. And yet I left the group of intelligent people. I found them stuffy, dishonest, mm -hmm. contemptuous of everyone else. And I don't want to go on. I see someone saying, maybe she's praising me. Maybe she's saying I'm talking too much. No, uh, she's <laughs> definitely praising you. But, she's saying uh, I could hear you speak all day. Yeah. I could listen to you. Yeah, could be, that could be read as I'm hearing you talk too much. But anyway. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> there was a... <clears throat> There was this weird aspect that if you said anything against the progressives, like they weren't just the most perfect people in the world, it was considered a conspiracy theory. How could you consider us, the party of good intentions, to be anything except well-intentioned? We might just make a mistake here and there. Uh, but that's the most. Yeah, what, and it, what road, what road uh, do good intentions pave? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, road the hell is paved with good intentions. But thanks. Uh, but... I realized as we pat ourselves on the back as the party of good intentions, we have good and bad intentions like everyone, for mm -hmm. God's sake. We're not even able to examine our bad intentions because we deny that they exist. And anyone who points them out, oh, that's a conspiracy theory about us mm -hmm. being bad intention. No, 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 can't be. And what's worse, what really makes this convoluted is that there was a kind of conspiratorial mentality among us progressives toward the common population, which was that, you know, if you tell them this fact in unvarnished form, they won't understand it. They're too, it stupid. The They're too mm -hmm. stupid and they won't understand it the right way. The right way means our way. <laughs> Their way is mean, bigoted, racist, homophobic. They didn't have homophobic back then, uh, all of which refer to real things. But the assumption that any other way of interpreting issues in any way related to that is the wrong way. And an, it's an obia or an ism to be condemned rather than, oh, it's a real problem to be thought about. Uh, it leads to not telling the truth to people on a mass collective scale and leads to an inner group atmosphere that parallels what would be done in a conspiracy, but it is not a conspiracy. Yes, the Islamophobia yes, buzzword yes. didn't even exist back oh, then. Yeah. Uh, it's a newer invention. And it, I wonder how it came up. Was it an imitation of the word homophobia? Uh, yeah, it was, and it was created by the Islamists in Iran. Yeah. And the intention was to well, just to silence criticism of Islam by saying that if you speak out against Islam, it's because you hate Muslims, yeah. right. you know. So, yeah, it was piggybacking on homophobia, but of course, with a completely different right. um, intention. Right. Yeah. Well, the intention I, I, I wasn't to love all people. The intention right. was to shut you down from criticizing. Otherwise, you were a hateful right. bigot. Right. I'm wondering if there's a deeper connection there, and probably not, but this is sort of just an ironic parallel, that homophobia, the use of the epithet is often explained by gay theory as, oh, those people are secretly suppressing their own homosexuality, therefore they become homophobes. <laughs> From an Islamic theological standpoint, as from a Christian theological standpoint, our theology is the truth, and everyone really knows it deep down in their heart. So if they disagree with us, they are expressing a fear and phobia of their real selves, which is to believe mm. in 
we say. So therefore, it's Islamophobia if they say anything critical of us. I wonder if that thought's there or if I'm just projecting it. <laughs> can can yeah. I say, you know what's so funny, the Islamophobia word? Um, well, the first time I heard, I was still in Islam. So I guess I was Islamophobia even when I was a Muslim because I was told I was Islamophobia. And that was the first time I heard the word, uh, this, uh, you know, just nonsense word is to silent anybody who speaks against, you know, the cult and everything that is happening within the community, code, code. Um, so I don't know. It's just, I laugh every time I, I hear this word, you guys, I don't know, Yasmin or Ali, if you guys feel the same way, but it just, for me, I was called Islamophobia while I was still in, uh, still wearing the hijab. And uh, yeah, speaking about, uh, regarding about the uh, female genital mutilation, that I was told I was being Islamophobia and I need to tone down. Yeah, I would say the irony, that, go ahead, Aaliyah, sorry, or Lois. The irony of it is that if you analyze the word Islamophobia, a phobia is a fear. Yeah. Islam is an idea, it's a, it's a concept, it's not people. And so it means yeah. fear of this idea which I think everyone should be afraid It's of. very rational. That's not a phobia. That's a very rational fear. Right. <laughs> yes. And yeah. it has nothing to do with, with, with hating Muslim people. It's the opposite. It's, you know, yes. fear of what they've been taught. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's just ironic that the term itself is ironic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on a slightly lesser degree, Christianophobia, I think, is justified also, despite Ayan Hirsi Ali, who refers to Christophobia, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Christianity used to be pretty horrible, too. And it, it's been out of power mm -hmm. for 500 years, thank mm -hmm. God. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, they stopped reading the Old Testament. In fact, yeah. Christians don't read the Bible at all. It, all when they have tests and things, it's been demonstrated that atheists know a lot more about the Bible than Christians do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, they've done a lot of testing and that's, yeah. and it has turned out that way. In fact, a lot of people, the reason they become atheists is because they do study the Bible with, you know, intently and discover all of the internal contradictions and internal nonsense <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. say, this is ridiculous. And yes. they leave. So it's the people, the, the most intense believers haven't read it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably, well, it's true of, of the Quran as well. Absolutely. That, yeah. So you don't know what's in there. And when you find out, you're shocked. Yeah. 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 So I wanted to apologize, though, that I got on late. I'm glad to see people find value in what I say. Thank you for the kind words. I spent my life coming out of various cults in my thinking uh, and dealing with them and trying to understand them. And maybe it helps some people uh, what I've come up with. I've written something that I hope will become a book about uh, the mainstream progressive cult and the mainstream elite. Uh, but I was late today because I was on a WhatsApp call with someone who needed my ministries. It's one of my former students in Russia. Uh, mm. And there they have a cult-like regime and it's mm -hmm. dangerous to talk. WhatsApp is a little mm. bit more secure than Zoom. So we did it yeah. that way. And we discussed and tried to discuss fairly freely as best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very difficult situations. I've been studying Russia for half a century and mm. it's been sad. It was marvelous to see it coming out of its cult under Gorbachev, a tremendous process of collective self-liberation mm -hmm. uh, organized from on high, and then terrible to see it falling back into a new mm -hmm. self-imposed cult, self-generated. Uh, mm -hmm. So, well, anyway, I did what I can with my former student and he with me. He doesn't see it as a cult. He thinks there's much more freedom of discussion there and reasonable and so forth. Well, compared to. <laughs> compared to the Soviet yes, era. Right. Compared yeah. to the Soviet era, I would say compared to the late Soviet era, no. Uh, probably mm -hmm. less now. But uh, compared to the mm -hmm. earlier Soviet era, yes. 
Uh, mm -hmm. but he sees it from inside and he is now in the bureaucracy uh, where he says they talk rationally, it's not a problem. Uh, I think in the Soviet bureaucracy, it was the same. I think in the Nazi bureaucracy, it was most of the time the same. The cult aspects are not 90% of life. Otherwise, it would be an immediate suicide cult for everyone. Uh, but it's still a terrible disaster when it comes to power on high. Mm -hmm. And yes, as it was being said in the chat, was it Aliyah? Everyone becomes a cult when they attack dissent. When the progressives mm -hmm. think first how to attack the other person, mm -hmm. do we call them Islamophobe, homophobe? Uh, racist, and then it's afterwards, and then mm -hmm. afterwards, try to come up with a rationalization for pinning this label on them, mm -hmm. right. and, and feel morally superior and affirm our own identity as the superior people by calling them these dirty names. We never have to deal with the substance of what they say. Where the first thought is how to exclude them from the thinking. After that, mm -hmm. you, you think about what they say, but you think about it in order to pin a label on them and maybe refute it, but at least come up with a line for putting it out, out of the way. Yeah, that's a cult. That's, mm -hmm. that's a vicious cult. It's, it's a malicious mm -hmm. cult. No, it's not the party of good people, alas and alack. Maybe it's good they think of themselves as good people. Some of them are called up short on it and are amazed to hear that they've done bad things and actually stop doing so. But many of them won't and can't. Yeah, I mean, I, I, jihadis think they're good people too. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, Lois. Mm -hmm. No, I, I again, I, well, like I say, I've been reading a lot of evolutionary psychology. Mm -hmm. And just go back to the savannas of Africa where we were in these small tribes. And we had to be tribal. Uh, Homo sapiens is not the fastest animal, is not the strongest animal, Is does not have any saber teeth. The only way we survived as a species was sticking together. Yeah. And so that's our nature. And we also survived by being suspicious of that tribe we don't know anything about. Because if we weren't suspicious of them, they would have done away with us. And so it's part of our nature that we need to understand it and guide it in the right direction. We need, we need community. It's, it's built into yeah. our human nature, <clears throat> but we need to learn how to create communities properly. Um, and they always, you know, that's one thing that Christian churches are supposed to do so well is create community. Oh, it's a wonderful community. You have this sense of belonging and being cared for until you cross yeah. them. <clears throat> and there's so many strings attached and you don't dare. And so it's really a lousy community in that sense. And so we need to work towards building communities where you are safe, where you are accepted, and you can express yourself without, again, without <clears throat> being judged. And it's really hard to do because <clears throat> we all have our innate biases, but we need to understand that we do have them. And mm -hmm. we have to keep them in check. And well, I'm, I'm working on a little short book <laughs> about this very thing, about another, I, I have all these little memes I make up. We have to accept who we are in order to become what we want to be. Mm -hmm. If we accept mm -hmm. that we are, that we have stone age brains, that yeah. we're tribal, and that we have all these things that kept us alive. That, that's why we exist. That's why we survive. Now let's redirect them in a way that's, that's constructive. Yeah. Yeah, not to throw cold water on this, but it, it goes back to what you were saying about the problem is we're human. Because that's why within our lifetime era, you could see these changes in Russia, like, oh, you're coming out of the cult. Oh, there you go again. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and we've done it too exactly. over here yeah, in absolutely. North America. Like I we watched <clears throat> it within our lifetimes, you know. Mm -hmm. We're 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 all talking about like 
I'm talking to my daughter about like back in the 90s, how excited we were. We're bringing down the Berlin Wall. We got rid yes. of apartheid. You know what I mean? There were so many reasons to feel so hopeful for the future. And we really thought, you know, suddenly gay pride parades were a thing. You know, we went through that whole AIDS horrible situation and we came mm-hmm. out the other side and we thought that we were really progressing in so many ways and the future is so bright, you know, I never expected this quickly to see things just devolve in in such a sad way. Um, But you're right. We have to remember who we are, what our limitations are. Um, there's a, there's a quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald that he had in, um, in his only novel, which I can't, oh, The Great Gatsby, um, where, and I don't know the quote exactly, I always get it wrong, but he basically talks about how we are on a ship. Humanity is on a ship. And even though it feels quite often that we're going backwards because we are, you kind of have to trust in the grand scheme of things that that ship is moving forward. And that quote is really helpful for me when I start to feel really despondent because then I can take a step back and think, okay, yes, it feels that way. Now we are in, we're in this backward motion at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, But you look back, you know, with a, with a, with a lens of like back a hundred years, you know, 200 years. And then you realize, okay, wow, we actually have done some great things. We actually have progressed quite a lot. And so, you know, it kind of forces me to have faith in humanity again, that we will, we'll find our way, you know, it'll might take a few decades till we get out of this rut that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll, we'll continue pushing forward. I think that, you know, you have to tell yourself that you have to believe that. Yeah. Especially when you're dealing in the dark topics that I'm dealing with all the time, you kind of have to force yourself yeah, to right. remain optimistic. As Aaliyah was saying in the, in the comments here, um, meditation is my you know cleansing our minds when it gets too heavy is crucial i meditate daily uh she says but it can be anything which makes us feel lighter just like me i meditate daily it's i have to now like it's it has to it keeps me grounded um, otherwise it just gets too much and and yes, I man, I agree with you. We have to, I think humanity, you're right. They will come out. We will come out because it's been, human, humanity is strong and we are, I think we will go through many things and we're going to come out hopefully stronger. And, we and have we're to examples have of that. Yes. Sahara, absolutely. Yeah, right? I agree. So, yeah. hundred <clears> percent. <throat> so I wholeheartedly agree with you. Everything you said, we have to have hope because hope is a light you know and if you have a light yeah. I think you survive um mm. yeah there's a lot of things happening in the world and uh, you seem like you know we're going backward or what we have fought you know I don't know what's going on but still there we have to have hope and we just have to move forward and I believe humanity will wake up and we're going to come out the other side stronger I 100% agree mm-hmm. with you yeah. so thank you by the way mm. congratulations for your podcast, Yasmin Hamid podcast. <laughs> I love it, the name. And I think, it, Thank you, I mean, the, you know, um, uh, Forgotten Feminist, definitely it was great, but I think I agree with you. You will bring more people, more perspective, and not only, you know, a female, but from all people, from all walks of life. Mm-hmm. So thank you for yeah. what you do. I love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I love you. Thank you. Love you more. Um, <laughs> Lois, I want to make sure I give you the last word before we conclude. Was there something that you wanted to share with our listeners? Any advice, any um, ideas on where we can follow you? Or you were talking about the support group. If you wanted to share Rocky Mountain Atheists, where people can follow it or or anything you like. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a big social media presence. And 
it's because I don't have time. That's good. <laughs> because everything is is a wrap around. Well, <clears throat> I I do a lot of things in the Rocky Mountain Atheists. And uh, and especially my main focus is the support group Life Without Religion. And <clears throat> so I'm involved in that. I do things in the Rocky Mountain Atheists that don't show. I mean, like I, I put out the newsletter, I, I run the webinars, I host several of the like coffee chat, which is just a simple, you know, social thing. And <clears throat> so I'm doing all that so I don't have a really personal presence, but keep urging me to write a couple of the books that I'm trying to put together. Mm -hmm. And this one is, uh, well, I think we're gonna call it, you know, can we ever get along? And I'm gonna go into some uh, uh, evolutionary psychology and some neuroscience and show how we have to understand ourselves. We have to, give give people room to be themselves and remember that everyone sees the world through different eyes we all see the world based on our experience our knowledge our own teachings and what we have learned beyond that so always remember that the other person is seeing the world through different eyes than yours and accept that. That's beautiful. That's, yeah, that reminds me of that Buddhist tale of the three blind men that were holding on to an elephant. Yeah, you've heard yes, it. Right. And they're all describing an elephant so differently. And they're all like, ah, you're wrong. That's not what an elephant is. But because one guy is holding mm -hmm. the tail, one guy is holding the little trunk, and the other guy is holding an ear or something. Um, so, they each one of them thinks that the other one's an idiot and yes. doesn't know what he's talking uh -huh. about. But it's it's like you said, yeah, it's because of all of our perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. I love everything that you said. I think that it is really important to allow people to to be themselves and to and to meet them where they are and to remember mm -hmm. that we're all seeing things from a different perspective. Um but I'll repeat again, because this is a lesson that I had to learn a really big lesson that we have to have that same kindness with ourselves and understand right. that we too are only touching one part of the elephant. And so, you know, to kind of be empathetic to ourselves with saying yes. like, okay, I know that, you know, I could only do what I, what I could do at that point in my life, because that's all I had. And that's all I understood. And so you know more, you, you know, you do better and, and we're like that ship too, I guess, yes. <laughs> as individuals. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? But thank and you I guess so much, one of my both. favorites is we can't change the world, but we yeah. can change somebody's world. So that's what we work towards. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. That's a great way to end mm -hmm. this. And thank you all so much. For I want joining to us. I want to honor our two cults. I, oh. <laughs> I joined Yasmin in the elephant cult. Uh, I've, I collect oh, elephant okay. trinkets, but above all, of course, really, of course, there is my cat. Cult. Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we all stand the cat cult. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, guys. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank all you right. so yes. much. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Have a lovely day, and I'll see you at the next podcast. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.